All right, friends. It is time for our next starter kit. We did pop punk, we did punk, we did hardcore. I think we did metalcore. Now it is time for my teen years. It is time for us to do the 90s metal starter kit where I will share with you, I don't know, there must be a couple people out there that don't know about 90s metal. I feel like this is a very well-documented era, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there is somebody out there who is wondering, hey, 90s metal sounds like a cool thing for me to be into, but where do I start? Well, if that person is out there and you find that person, you just send them this video because this will be a great list of bands to start with. Now, of course, I have to say, when it comes to 90s metal, it is such an enormous list of bands that should be talked about because I would say, I honestly think the 90s might be the best era of metal in the sense of there was just so much innovation happening, so much cool new experimental stuff happening that was also good. I feel like, you know, it is such fertile territory that it's impossible for me to pluck all the ripe fruits from the sagging vines of 90s metal but i will do my best to at least give you a little sampling and if you like these bands you know you go on spotify go to the fans also like and you know you can go from there this will get you started at least i think hopefully but first, I want to thank DraftKings for sponsoring this video. It is fall, which means that moment we've been waiting for is here. That's right, it is NFL season. And everybody knows that NFL football is the best sport. It's just a fact. And what better way to kick that off than with an exciting deal from DraftKings Sportsbook, an official betting partner of the NFL. And best of all, new customers, all you have to do is bet $5 on any NFL wager and you will instantly receive $200 in free bets. That's right, DraftKings is giving all new customers $200 in free bets when they place any $5 or more wager on the football team of their choice. And for those of you who live in a state where sports betting is not yet available, don't forget about DraftKings Daily Fantasy, where they have been innovating even more ways to win some cash this football season. And also, very important, DraftKings has been around for quite a while, so you know that your funds are safe and you can withdraw them whenever, wherever you want, which makes me feel better because I actually had some bad experiences with that years ago with another site. So if you want to check that out, download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now at the link in the description of this video. New customers use the promo code FINN, F-I-N-N, -N, and receive $200 in free bets instantly when placing a $5 wager. Hit the link in the description of this video and use promo code FINN, F-I-N-N, -N, only at DraftKings Sportsbook. <laughs> Again, there's no way that I can possibly cover all of it. There's going to be many, many, many bands. There's going to be entire subgenres that I leave out of this video. That's because this is just a starter kit. This is not the exhaustive list of every 90s metal band. It's just a starter kit. Now, of course, we've got to start with the easy stuff. We got to start with new metal, probably the stuff that people think of as most synonymous with the 90s. By the way, I paused it on the perfect frame. Look at this, a guy with two eyebrow piercings. Does not get any more 90s than that, my friends. I'm sure you guys are all familiar with Korn, but just in case there's somebody out there that is like, oh, I know who Korn is, but I've never listened to the first Korn album. Well, you have to. I mean, it is required. It's great. You have to listen to the first Korn album. Required listening. And you have to dress like this, too. Imagine walking down the street and seeing this. <laughs> But it was normal in the 90s. This is what every single person, everybody looked like this in the 90s. Your teacher, the cops, the cashier at Walmart, every single human being on earth dressed like this 24 seven in the 90s. It's a fact. I mean, if you don't like this album, there's something wrong with you. The bagpipes. I'm gonna go ahead and say that uh, the bagpipes, they could have just left that off the album. It would have been fine. They just, they, you don't need to bring the zany instruments. You know, when you see like bagpipes or like a tuba or like fucking, uh, what's the Vuvuzela or didgeridoo, any sort of like zany unorthodox instruments, when you see those coming into the metal album, generally a sign that it's going to suck, but Korn is the exception because this album is a 10 out of 10 classic. Are you ready? How many, 
How many of you are ready? I hope that everybody raises their hand and says, me, I'm ready. I'm ready. You got to be ready. So everybody knows this. I'm going to skip the obvious stuff. Another, when it comes to new metal also, if for some reason you are one of the like six people on the planet who hasn't already listened to this album, the first Slipknot album, which is from 99, barely makes it into the 90s, but still, I mean, it's a classic for a reason. 10 out of 10 album, it's great. You gotta listen to the first Slipknot album. It is interesting to me that uh, these bands have been retconned as credible, though, because if you were old enough to have been a teenager or in your 20s back then, you will know that listening to Korn and Slipknot was the least credible thing you could possibly do. Listening to Slipknot in 1999 was the equivalent of listening to MGK in the current year. Like Slipknot was an absolute laughingstock with zero respect in metal for many, many years. So it is very interesting to see how, uh, you know, as always happens, I've talked about a million times, like the music that's written off as terrible, trendy garbage for posers who shop at the mall, you know, 10, 15 years later, you know, becomes defined as classics, just the way it is. Now, I will say though, in this case, they're right. Korn and Slipknot are actually great bands, at least these albums. So if for some reason, you haven't listened to either of those albums, you really should because they are classics. It's true. Let's move on to some stuff that maybe you don't hear people talk about quite as much. I mean, it's not like this is exactly obscure, but a band that I feel like people don't talk about as much as they should these days is Jane's Addiction, who I would consider to be kind of the founders of alternative metal, I think. You know, it's debatable how metal they actually were, but, you know, compared to, say, the Dead Milkmen or The Cure or bands that were considered alternative, you know, Jane's Addiction were a lot more metal. So... You know, that's what they were called at the time, alternative metal. And I will say, I was kind of on the fence about Jane's Addiction at the time, but listening to it now, shit holds there up. Also, a very, a very, show. very good drummer, Stephen Perkins. Very good drummer. You don't hear his name come up these days as much as you should. Kind of punk, kind of metal, kind of weird hippie shit. Again, the uh, the 90s fashion, a lot of dreadlocks. Uh, Dave Navarro here with dreadlocks. I don't know why so many people thought that dreadlocks were okay in the 90s. You remember there's that video of George Bush like explaining why they blew up some, they killed a bunch of civilians in some like raid they did in, you know, Iraq or whatever. And uh, he was like, mistakes were made explaining you know, why they killed a bunch of civilians. I feel like that's how, when, they, when we look back in the 90s and uh, we see all the dreadlocks, the eyebrow piercings, you know, and uh, you're brought before court and they're like, uh, sir, would you care to explain these photos of yourself with eyebrow piercings and dreadlocks from 1992? And you just, uh, <clears throat> mistakes were made. I feel like that's the only way to, uh, to answer the question. And the, the hat, look at these hats. Uh, Stone Gossard and Jeff Emmett from uh, Pearl Jam also wore these like, this. and they're not berets. They're just, like those weird, like floppy hippie kind of hats. Very popular in the early 90s. Really awful. I really hope those don't come back. You're right. Of course, Jane's Addiction is metal. They're playing Ibanez. It's exactly. That's how you know that they're metal because Dave Navarro is playing an Ibanez. So if you haven't checked out Jane's Addiction, actually a great band. And also... You got to thank uh, Perry Farrell from Jane's Addiction, the singer, for starting Lollapalooza. I would say Lollapalooza, one of the most important developments in alternative culture, like, ever. I think the first one is in 90 or 91. Uh, I went to, I th it might have been the first one. I went to the one that had uh, Jane's Addiction, Body Count, Rollins Band, and Susie Sue, I think, was maybe in 91. Uh, and that was really like a breakout moment for alternative culture. So not only is the band good, but you got to thank Perry Farrell for starting Lollapalooza and doing so much for alternative music. Now, another band that, of course, everybody knows, but I feel like they don't know the best stuff is White Zombie. Specifically their first album, La Sex or Sisto. I would say this album is the better one, in my opinion. Less industrial and more like thrash meets like psychedelic i would say this is the album to check out e exactly and again more dreads with those same weird hats the dreads and those hats 
what is it with that? Why did we think that those, that dreads and those floppy hats were cool in the early 90s? I don't know. I never thought that the floppy hats were cool, but I definitely thought that the dreads were cool. I think this is a great album. Very underrated. People know Black Sunshine and Thunder Kiss 65, which are great songs. But the whole album, it's one of these things, I hate to say it, but you guys know that I am, for the most part, I, I listen to singles. I'm not really like an album person because I just, I don't care. Uh, but I will say there are a limited number of albums that really are best experienced as an album. And I would say that this is one of them. You really do want to like sit down and listen to it from start to finish at least a couple times. The sequence of songs, the albums actually does matter. There's interludes, you know, looking, you, you really want to like sit down with it and experience it like that if you're into that sort of thing. I got to say though, looking at this video and knowing how much this band toured back then, how bad do you think they smelled? You got dreads, you got all these like weird crusty clothes with too many holes in them and stuff. And knowing that they're living on the road 200, 250 days a year, uh, you got to think that uh, they must have reeked. You know, I feel like if you dress this way, you could like boil your clothes in bleach and they'll still reek. They'll still smell like the combination of like BO, sweat, and weed, even if you don't smoke weed, you still smell like weed. If you wear one of those hats and if you have dreads, it just makes you smell like weed, even if you don't actually smoke weed. And the crotch smell from those leather pants, yeah. I mean, just just imagine the stench, ugh, God. And the boots, just everything about this just makes me think, this is a band that does not smell good. That's my guess. Another big kind of flavor of 90s metal would be all the uh, industrial metal stuff. One I would point to is Fear Factory. And before we listen to the Fear Factory album that a lot of people know, which is Demanufacture and is fantastic. If you have not ever checked out their uh, very early stuff when they were still a grind band, super good. Like I'm not really that into grindcore, but this is some of the best grind that anybody has ever made. Listen how fucking good they were as a grind band. This shit is so good. One of the best to ever do this style. They're so good. But of course, most people know them for this stuff. Soul of a New Machine and D Manufacturer. And I gotta say, I think this stuff still holds up. Yeah, the artwork too, super 90s. This kind of riffing, that like super chunky, very gated kind of riffing that's like very tight, uh, tightly tied to the kick drum. I don't think anybody had done that before Fear Factory. This was like, this was like, it sounded like something out of the fucking future. I mean, that kind of riffing is insane. Yeah, exactly. Dino is a super underrated guitarist. Sphere Factory is like Meshuggah, except without the recognition. Yeah, I, that's totally right. Put some respect on Dino's name, goddammit. I feel bad because I feel like I have sort of not given him the credit that he deserves in some of my videos. He's a cool guy. Check out my podcast with him if you haven't. Definitely listen to this album. It sounds incredible. It still sounds great to this day. This mix is incredible. I mean, listen to this riffing, man. This is, this shit is brutal. The other thing uh, that they were, I don't know, probably, they probably pioneered is the mix of like, you know, the screaming with the sort of sing-songy kind of thing, the good cop, bad cop vocals. I'm pretty sure like if there's anybody that did it before them, I'm not aware of it. Certainly they were the ones that popularized it. And so when you think about those two things that are such a huge part of metal now, meaning those sort of like very tight, chuggy syncopated riffs and also the good cop bad cop vocals fear factory really you got to give them the credit for really pioneering uh, a, a huge portion of that so shout out to fear factory and to dino put some respect on their name and if you're into any kind of like industrial anything you got to listen to fear factory one of the very best to ever do it also in the same vein is ministry at least this album early ministry Sounds like this. 
Early Ministry sounds like Joy Division. Complete with a fake British accent. If you like it, that's cool, but that's not the ministry we're here to talk about. We are here to talk about the ministry uh, of the 90s, specifically the album uh, Psalm 69, was actually quite popular because of Beavis and Butthead and it got a lot of MTV airplay and stuff like that. If you want to talk about riffs, this is just some of the most relentless riffing you will ever hear. Just riffs for days. Sick thrash riffs with industrial. Hard to go wrong. I love this album. I saw them, I don't know, three or four times around this era. I think Al Jurgensen definitely was on heroin and meth and everything else around this era. You didn't think he was on everything. I read Al Jurgensen's book and I was really disappointed. His book is just a bunch of drug stories. And it's disappointing because Al Jurgensen was actually like very innovative as like a musician, as a producer. Like think about making this kind of music that sounds so like cold and mechanical with so many like edits and samples and stuff like that in, in the late 80s and early 90s with tape. I legitimately don't know how you even do that. And so he talks a little bit in there about like cutting tape and editing it together and like sort of a little bit about the production process. But uh, mostly the book is just full of drug stories, which is a little bit of a little bit disappointing. And the new ministry stuff is just absolutely awful. Holy shit. Look at this. This looks like one of those like quarantine videos that everybody made on Zoom and then like sent each other the videos and like they had some friend of theirs from community college edit it together. Like, how do you go from being that good to this bad? <laughs> I don't understand. Like, this is some of the worst. This is, like, worse than a local band. <laughs> Look, they even have the bootleg emojis, like the ones I use on some of my thumbnails. They even use these shitty emojis, but not ironically. Do not listen to New Ministry. Only listen to 90s Ministry, because that is when they were great. The next big flavor of 90s metal is Groove Metal. The biggest name here, of course, is Pantera. I've talked about them before. Everyone knows about Pantera, so I don't need to go on too much about it. But... Pantera did change everything. It is true. Pantera changed everything just as much as Nirvana did. Metal was never the same after Pantera. One of the best bands of all time. Vinny has always looked the same. Whether he was like 30 or 55, he looked the same. It could not be more fitting that he was in a band called Hell Yeah, because everything about Vinny Paul, when you look at him, Everything about him just says, hell yeah, brother. Vinny Paul is the personification of hell yeah, brother. I also got to say, um, as my friend Jose says, <laughs> this is the most racist guitar riff of all time. <laughs> it's a great riff. It is also the most racist guitar riff of all time. Now, Pantera was not the only name in groove metal. The other one would be Machine Head, specifically this song and this album, Burn My Eyes. This came out in 96, I think. This really sent a, uh, sent a shockwave through the underground. I want to be one of these music journalists that just uses all these super hackneyed terms like that, like buzzsaw guitars and machine gun drums and sent a shockwave through the underground. But this album did actually kind of do that. When this came out, everyone wanted to sound like Machine Head. Also, you gotta love uh, Rob Flynn's cornrows. <laughs> the W word Rob Flynn era, yes. This is a pretty fucking sick drop. It takes a minute to get into it, but this is a sick drop. After this long, long intro, here comes the drop. Great drumming, too. Look at that. Look at this. Rob Flynn with his uh, Mickey Mouse Sepultura beanie, whatever that is, like a beanie with like mouse ears or cat ears or something. The cornrows and whatever's going on with his goatee here. I mean, like I said, we had a lot of ideas in the 90s about what looked cool. Um, this was not it. In hindsight, mistakes were made. This 
this uh, Sepultura type breakdown here. Incredible. It sounds a lot like modern, modern hardcore, yes. This just sounds like every band camp, hardcore band now, except this has much better production. Great album, uh, you know, and the groove metal thing. I think it's, uh, I don't know, I, I'll very quickly try to kind of describe the difference. I think now we take the groove thing kind of for granted because after Pantera and Machine Head and stuff came out or New Metal came out, everybody in metal like has groove, but this would be more representative of what people thought metal sounded like before there was groove. Which isn't bad, but this was the pre-groove era. You know what I mean? Fire, Fire in the hole. No groove. Some tasty riffs, but no groove. Okay, uh, next up, we have the goth metal flavor. I'm gonna include Danzig here. You know, you can debate as to whether they're goth or not, but you know, when I think of goth metal, what I think of is girls who wear a lot of velvet with fishnet either stockings or like arm whatever you call it like sleeves fishnet sleeves fingerless gloves that kind of thing dancing fans were definitely that i braided my goatee once why did you ever stop that's the real question i think dancing kind of sucks but the fact of the matter is that they were a very important part of 90s metal 90s stripper music, absolutely. I hated dancing back then, and yet I saw them probably four or five times because there was always some other band that I wanted to see. I saw White Zombie with Danzig for sure. I don't remember who else. I, I saw like several other bands open for Danzig. And so somehow or another, I ended up seeing them four or five times around this era. And uh, not a fan, but I will say one of the coolest logos of all time, even if he uh, he did steal their logo from a comic book. He also stole the Misfits logo from some old movie, uh, but he does have great taste. I'll give him that. And when it comes to fishnet shirts, who wore it better than Danzig? Look at that. Five foot three, still with the confidence to wear V-neck fishnet tank top. Do you not aspire to that level of confidence. Nobody has ever believed in themselves as much as Glenn Danzig believed in himself in this very moment. And the MMA gloves also a nice touch. <laughs> Sigourney Weaver. <laughs> yeah, he does kind of look like Sigourney Weaver, doesn't he? Anyway, uh, check out Danzig if you haven't. You know, I don't think they're a great band, but if we want to talk about the starter kit for 90s metal, they belong there under the goth heading. The other band there, for sure, that uh, you got to check out when it comes to gothic metal in the 90s, which I believe is the better band, is Typo Negative. People may be surprised to find out that I think Typo Negative is a great band, but I do. Pete Steele is like what Glenn Danzig wanted to be. For one, tall, very good looking, also very smart, very clever, insightful, self-aware guy. Unfortunately, God took him from us too early because there's just too much, uh, too much gothic metal energy for one person. One man's body could not contain that much chi. Great songwriting. It's such an interesting production too. Like listen to these guitar and drum tones. It's like such a strange sound. Like nobody has sounded like them before or since. It's very interesting. I actually like all their albums. Uh, this one, in my opinion, is probably the strongest, but I think they're all good. Yeah, great cheekbones. I met Typo Negative at a signing thing at a store. Even sitting down, Pete was towering over everyone. Yeah, big, big guy. Yeah, and very interesting voice. He sounds tall, doesn't he? Whoa, whoa, whoa. I'll do a video about Typo Negative one of these days because uh, I think that they're a, a very interesting band. You know, typically anything goth is corny to me, yet somehow Typo Negative, Pete Steele managed to be goth with and do shit like this. You know, have like vampires and, you know, piano and his video and stuff like that. And yet somehow it wasn't corny. He could pull it off. I like it. Good stuff. Now, the last thing is death metal. And I feel like death metal is sort of a whole other, I don't know. That's like a whole video into itself. I could do like a 90s metal, a uh, 90s death metal starter kit. However, uh, the 90s were the golden era of death metal for a lot of people. I mean, it's when death metal was actually on MTV, believe it or not. Thanks to Beavis and Butthead. Thanks to Headbangers Ball. Shout out to Ricky Rackman uh, for making that happen. You know, this is when like Earache Records was on top of the world. Cannibal Corpse was in Ace Ventura. 
this was the golden era of death metal for sure. I mean, there's been a lot of good death metal since then, but 90s death metal, I think most people would agree that was like really the golden era. Uh, and there's a million bands I could talk about, but if you're interested, I would start with some of the classic earache and roadrunner bands. First one being Morbid Angel, in my opinion, probably the best 90s death metal band. This is such a cool album, such a weird video and a weird song. But really good songwriting, you know? Like this is actually a super catchy song, even though it's like fast death metal. Death of the world, burn my door. I'm generally not into solos, but I will say uh, Trey from Orbit Angel has such interesting, bizarre solos. I remember him saying in guitar magazines that he wanted his solos to sound like a warped tape that had been like sitting in the back of your car for a week in the sun. And that is actually what they sounded like. Such, such a weird style. It's like Carrie King, but even weirder and faster. This is like, you know, fast old school death metal, but it's actually catchy with like vocal hooks. You know, that's what made Morbid Angel so good. It's like actual vocal hooks. It's so catchy. So that is uh, Rapture by Morbid Angel off their album Covenant. I would say the first four Morbid Angel albums are great. They, they are in alphabetical order. The A, B, C, D albums, I would say are all great. I actually have a Morbid Angel tattoo. Another band you want to check out, which is sort of the opposite of Morbid Angel. Morbid Angel was like the fast, like insane, like crackhead death metal. Obituary would be the opposite of that. They were like slow and super groovy. Like Morbid Angel is not a groove band. Obituary is like pure groove such a weird like they played strats such a weird distinctive sound this has some of the best drumming and like donald tardy is one of my favorite drummers this just grooves so hard such good groove yeah tons of modern hardcore bands rip them off as they should i mean how many hardcore bands now just want to sound like this the uh the red hot chili pepper shirt i remember back when this came out being very like surprised that he was wearing a red hot chili pepper shirt like that what that's not metal they're a death metal band he's not allowed to like red hot chili peppers this thrash part here sounds so cool because the rest of the song is so slow this thrash part sounds so fast even though it's not at all <laughs> This outro is like a minute long and it just grooves so fucking hard. Such cool drumming here. He does this cool ride thing here in a minute. Here. Anyway, uh, obituary. And then the last 90s death metal band that I would suggest you check out, um, the creators of what you would think of as like modern, like melodic death metal is Carcass, hands down. I mean, Carcass and At The Gates are the two bands that really defined that sound. I don't like this album personally because I don't like melodic death metal, but artwork, definitive classic album in this genre. I mean, this still sounds remarkably modern to me. Like how many bands are still copying this 25 years later? This is like what ruined Carcass to me. I like early Carcass. But how many bands are still ripping this off, you know? To this day, 25 years later, it's still the template for a whole genre. It's not for me, but you got to include it on the list if we're talking about 90s metal. So there we have it. That is the 90s metal starter kit from new metal to alternative metal to industrial metal to groove metal to gothic metal to death metal. You've got it all. There you go. So next time somebody asks you, hey, I would like to get into 90s metal. Where do I start? You say, I'm glad you asked. I've got just the video for you. You just send them a link to this and there you go. Then they have their 90s metal starter kit. And that does it for this starter kit. Join us next time for another one.